Now, one of, the, one of the premises, one of the things that I think really captured people's imagination about phototourism and photosynth when we first started talking about it in public was uh, this idea of using collective intelligence to map out the world. You know, if we, if we, uh, if we can reconstruct Notre Dame Cathedral by going to Flickr, then is it the case that uh, large parts of the physical world are already there uh, on, the, on the web, just waiting to be reconstructed in 3D using the, using the photos that are already available. Um, and this, this idea got a bunch of us very, very excited. But the results, um, I would say, are mixed. They're mixed. The results are mixed. Um, this, is, um, this is why. So if, if we take a, a famous place like Piazza Navona and we do a regular uh, image, uh, image search on the web, you get tons of, so 88,000 hits on, on, uh, on Bing images. Um, Roughly the same on Google, and uh, the, of course many of these um, many of these images are are less are less than a megapixel. They tend to be quite small. Uh, if, if you find images on the web, they, they often will be, re be reduced to very small size because they're not using Sea Dragon, and and that's and that means that they're they're not uh, they're not all that useful for reconstructing. But worse than that, um, the images are all taken from the same places. So you get uh, you get better images if you go to a website like Flickr. Uh, so these are not uh, pictures that are just on the web at large, but on, explicitly on photo sharing sites. So you get fewer, fewer images, 29,000 on Flickr, but when you compare with the entire web at 88,000, 29,000 is quite a lot, especially since most of these are really large and beautiful images. And this is just one photo sharing site. So when you, when you add up all of the big photo sharing sites, you get, you get huge, huge numbers and very high quality. However, um, the the connectivity patterns among those photos are the, are the somewhat dismaying part. Uh, well, dismaying, I don't know, it's, it's, it's interesting. So this is a, an example of a graph of connections between photos of the Ta Prom temple in Cambodia. So each of those circles is a, a, represents a photo, and I've drawn here an edge between two photos when they share uh, feature points. In other words, when they're, when they're viewing something that, that, that's, uh, that's the same in 3D as, as, a, as a neighboring photo. And uh, what you find is that um, there, there is, in the case of Taprom, there is in fact one uh, what's called mega-connected component, meaning one set of photos that's all connected and, that, and that, that's fairly large. So both of these big clusters and this stuff over here and these things all connect together. And this is actually some images of a particular place in the front of the temple that everybody takes. And another place at the back of the temple that everybody takes. Right? And this is exactly what you find. People are not very uh, imaginative, I suppose, and they take the same picture again and again and again and again. And the only thing that changes is which face is in front. Um, uh, to, uh, this is to the point where, where there have been some, some people not so facetiously suggesting cameras that consist of nothing but a GPS uh, and a compass uh, with no lens that, you know, if you, if you go somewhere and you click, it'll just, you know, look up, uh, you know, whoever took. Um, and I think if you, if, you did, if you did the small twist where you take whoever your traveling companion was and you insert their photo into the center, then you'd be done. That's, that, that, that'd be it. Um, so, uh, so that's, and that's what you get. You get these very, very peaky distributions. If you think about a, a statistical distribution over space, over X and Y and orientation and so on, over the entire Earth, where are photos taken of what? It's a distribution that has very, very high peaks uh, in, in a desert, right? otherwise in a, in, a, in a desert of zeros. There are, uh, there are interesting things, of course, that you can get by looking at uh, many, many images of exactly the same thing, like when, when there are fig trees in the Angkor Wat temple compl complex that grow up and then are cut back and damage that happens to the stones, and you want to see this at every possible time of day and you know, you use a slider to look at its evolution over time. You can do that sort of thing, but you, but you can't really wander around the Angkor Wat temple, compl temple complex based on uh, Flickr photos. That doesn't really work out. Now, on the other hand, one of the really nice things about, about launching a service that's explicitly about people creating synths, and, uh, and they're starting to really become a very active community of people doing this now, is that uh, people photograph differently when they, when they use this thing. They, they take photos to synth. On the front page of synths of Notre Dame, of which there were quite a few, uh, even after those first three weeks, there was, there was already one synth that was way better than what we could reconstruct from Flickr. And all it took was, uh, was one person um, photographing it sort of systematically. So this, was, uh, this is one person just you know, taking all, all kinds of different views and close-ups, and that's the point cloud. 
Um, so it, I mean, we, we like to tell the story always about you know, the wisdom of crowds and how the crowd does better than the individual and so on, but in this case, the individual does a lot better than the crowd. Um, although, uh, a crowd of individuals might do better, better still, so that's, that's one of the directions that we're taking photos of next. People synth all sorts of stuff, like they're, they're, there's this little community of people synth, you know, synthing uh, fruit and so on. Uh, so, so people synth all kinds of stuff, but um, especially among the top favorites, a great many synths are geolocatable. So I'm graying out now the ones that are not geolocatable. And by geolocatable, I mean correspond to a particular place on Earth at a reasonable scale, um, you know, that's, that's, not, that's not too different from, from a map, and, um, and that are not private environments, they're not somebody's bedroom. If they're indoor spaces, they're, uh, they're, they're public galleries and things like this. Uh, so when you look at a breakdown of those top 100 synths, you find some really, uh, some really bizarre stuff uh, that I, I certainly didn't anticipate. Uh, so art is very popular, which is very nice. So 10% of these top 100 synths were, of, were of, uh, of, of public sculptures and things like this. Lots and lots of archaeological sites. So by now, uh, every, uh, every famous archaeological site has been synthed, uh, most of them many times. Uh, lots of beaches and coastlines. And this one is especially intriguing. Uh, lots of aerial synths. So people do it by taking photos from small planes, uh, by, uh, by taking panoramas from very high places, from skyscrapers and... and uh, uh, and overlooking canyons, they do it uh, uh, using cameras attached to kites. Uh, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool what people are doing. And uh, this is just a typical example of one of these aerial synths. So this is, uh, this is uh, a little resort peninsula in Croatia, in a place where uh, none of the mapping sites, I, I, might, I might add, have particularly good vector data. This is, and this is just one person's uh, aerial synth of Primostin from above, uh, which has entire islands that are not even visible in the um, in the map. So this is, this is just a, a, a view inside that synth. And as this guy flew over um, the town, he took, he took aerial images that are um, more detailed and of higher quality than any, than any of the aerial imagery, imagery on any of the various mapping sites on the internet now. So, uh, so this is, I think this is really an interesting um, idea and, and trend of having even, even images from the air, even images of very large parts of the earth getting, uh, getting crowdsourced like that. All right, so I'm going to show one last uh, thing before stepping down, which is uh, a video of, uh, of some of our newer uh, techniques for, uh, for doing reconstruction. So uh, this, is, this is just a point cloud now that I'm showing you, and I, I've just paused it. It's of Kelvin Grove uh, Art Gallery. And uh, these, are, these diamonds in the sky over here are, are, the, um, are the cameras. I think this was done with a helicopter. And what you're, what you're seeing down here is just points. Okay, so it's just, it's just uh, the photosynth point cloud augmented with stereo techniques. So that's the, that's the, the level of, of, uh, of three-dimensional reconstruction of, of things on the Earth that, that one person can, uh, can do in, um, uh, in, in 10 minutes uh, from a helicopter. Um, and uh, again, this is just the point cloud, of course. If we, if we you know, really going to the next step in doing, doing complete 3D reconstructions is obviously something that we're very interested in, in doing as well. And I'm, I'm hoping that this is the kind of thing that uh, over the next uh, five years uh, is, is, going to, is going to really take um, a lot of our physical experience of the world visually and create uh, an online version of it, a mirror world version of it, uh, and of course, that lets you. That gives you all sorts of interesting superpowers, right? It lets you. Uh, it lets you teleport yourself anywhere in the world you want. Uh, it lets you um, experience augmented reality by by um, by giving you a, a model against which your your camera can uh, can match its visual experience, so that so things can, is semantic information can be added on top. Um, really, all of this is about. Uh, extending our our abilities and extending our extending our senses, extending our um, our our perception and our understanding of the physical world around us. Uh, I'll end there. Thank you very very much. <laughs>